Yes, we're going to go build. I have a lease with the neighbor. Oh, I feel like that. Did you make your private offer for herself? No, no. I think you're using it. She wasn't really using it. I changed my address, but they still seem to Virginia to have a lot of albums. I should call them. Okay. Hello, everybody. I think we're going to get started, even though our faculty um, edition is not with us yet. I'm sure she'll be here soon. Um, my name is Meg Rigo, and I work in our Center for Community Engagement and Service. Thank you so much for um, choosing this as one of your sessions today. Um, so what we're talking about, or what we're going to be talking about, is the Community Service Learning Program and other community-based learning initiatives that are happening here. Um, at the university. But before we get into that, I think it would be really helpful um, for us to know who you are, there aren't very many of us, um, why it is that, what about this session you found to be appealing so that when we're sharing, we can try to meet some of your interests. And then I'm also going to have first um, the panel just briefly introduce themselves, your name, um, what your connection is to this program, and then you can go into more details after when we get to your specific sessions so that you know who's in the room from the very beginning. Um, so my specific title is Program Coordinator for Community-Based Learning, and I work in our Center for Community Engagement and Service here on campus. And so one of my primary responsibilities is to set up partnerships between um, faculty members, departments, students, and community agencies um, with the goal of meeting some type of academic interest that the faculty members have and um, some type of community need that the partners have. Uh, so we'll pass it along to Sean today. Hi, my name is Shante Harris. I'm a rising senior at American University, and I actually um, did CSLP for three semesters, so the actual maximum number of semesters you can do it. And I also um, worked with Meg this past semester in her office, um, actually with the CSLP program, helping to promote it and get people to sign up. So. Do you want to just say who you are and that you've offered CSLP in the past, and then we'll go into more detail. Good. Got it. Uh, my name is Amanda Jamka. I am a writing instructor in the college writing program. I have been teaching an entire course that has community-based learning for four years now, and I've offered many students the CSLP option and worked with them in different aspects of creating those projects. Uh, my name is Lucy Mendez. I am actually a grad student here at AU in the sociology department, but I work part-time with Latino Student Fund. Um, we met Meg, um, I've actually been with them for a year, so I met Meg um, last October, I believe, and then we had a meeting uh, this summer just kind of like to strengthen our partnership. She told us about this great program, and um, we're really looking forward to building a stronger relationship with the AU community. Hi guys, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alex Hitch. I work as well for the Latino Student Fund. I am the Educational Programs Manager with the focus on college prep. Um, and as Lucy said, uh, both her and I have come in around the same time. And for us, we have a lot of programming. And this program, bringing AU students in as volunteers in all facets, we're a very small organization, has been extremely helpful. Uh, and when Meg said, do you want to be on this panel to talk about students coming to your organization and, and seeing how we can get other AU students involved with a lot of the organizations here in DC, I was like, absolutely. We're a huge proponent of this of this program, uh, and so we're very happy to be here and happy to meet you guys. <laughs> so Gretchen, I'm going to pass it your way and we can go around. Oh, great. Okay, great. Um, I'm Gretchen Mulkey. I'm the program coordinator uh, for the Community-Based Research Scholars Program, which is a new freshman living learning community on campus. So we will have 40 students who are coming in as freshmen who will engage in the community, and CSLP is a, a potential nice pathway for them in the future after they finish their first year with us. <laughs> And I, I want just want to meet everyone else in the room. <laughs> Would you like to do it? Sure. I'm Lisa Bonds. I work in the Office of Campus Life for the um, mm -hmm. Vice President of Campus Life. I'm here just to get more information and talking to folks about um, what the program is and what it offers. Oh, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> I'm Becca Simpson. I'm the new GA for um, Community Service Learning. I'm here as the Office of Campus Life and through the Community Center for Engagement and Service. And I'm studying public anthropology. Okay. I'm Katie Poland. I'm an adjunct in the business school. I'm teaching the Washington Initiative course, which has a component where we're doing um, a project. Each mm -hmm. each group of students will do a project with a local nonprofit. Okay. I'm Courtney Pollock. I'm the program advisor for the Department of World Languages and Cultures. So I do all the academic advising for undergrads and grads in our MA 
in our Latin American Studies program. Uh, well, thank you all for sharing. I know that we are a small group today, so feel free to ask questions at any time, interrupt us, we can make this more like a conversation. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to give a brief overview as to what community-based learning is um, and talk specifically about the community service learning program. Um, and then Amanda will speak to it from the faculty perspective to this program. Shante will speak to it from the student perspective. And Lucy and Alex will talk about it from the community partner side. So you start to get um, all the different perspectives of what goes into the program and making it what it happens to be. Um, so, just to start, defined, community-based learning is a teaching and learning strategy that integrates meaningful service with instruction and reflection to enrich the learning experience, teach civic responsibility, and strengthen communities. And so, when we talk about any type of service learning, any type of community-based learning, and we frequently use those, ter those terms interchangeably, um, we're talking about something that has these three things. So, we have the meaningful service. Um, it's something that's beneficial to the community partner and to the student's education. Um, it's connected to an academic course, um, so students are earning some type of academic credit for it. Um, and students are involved in some form of critical reflection. So it's great that you're spending all of this time volunteering in the community um, and, it's, and having those conversations and learning about maybe poverty by working at um, a soup kitchen and having conversations with individuals weekly about what their life's like. But unless you're connected, unless you're um, really starting to think about it and critically reflect about it and how it relates to your poverty and culture course, there's a chance that it could just be service and your course could just be the learning and the service learning never happens. And so we really want to make sure that critical reflection piece is there. Um, and some of the main ideas um, are one that the academic credit is for learning not for service um, and so we encourage you to consider service as the text. Um, so students don't receive an A because they went home and they read 25 pages of the textbook. They received the A because when they went into class they were able to answer whatever questions they needed to on that test. So they are able to demonstrate their knowledge. Um, and this is another thing that I think is sometimes hard um, for us as educators is, you know, you did it, it's really good, we're so happy that you were at the Latino Student Fund and you were working with those students and they definitely benefited, but we need for our students to also be able to demonstrate, you know, how did this contribute to them and how it contributed educationally, and that's why we get academic credit for it. So we need to make sure we keep that high standard there. Um, a ton of research has been done on service learning and here are some of the great student learning outcomes that we have seen for students that have been involved in, ser in service learning across the country. Um, we can see from this little pie chart um, that it impacts them personally, socially, educationally, it informs types of career possibilities that they have, um, and then also institutionally there's been research that shows that students involved in this type of learning actually will increase retention rates. It's actually one of the high impact practices um, that we talk about um, as educators. And so um, from everything from, you know, studies have shown that students who do this actually perform better on tests. If you are teaching, I don't know, we should compare this to your classes, but if you have students doing the same work, one in a service learning class and one in a class that does not have a service learning component, According to the research, the service learning classes, GPAs at the end, it should be slightly higher than the class that did it without that practical knowledge associated with it. Um, and so here are um, some general student learning outcomes and I'm happy to circulate these afterwards if you want to look into any of them in more detail. Um, and just to know that here at American University, community-based learning is really grounded um, in the strategic plan of the institution. Um, so right in our transformational goals, we see things like students will have an unwavering commitment to the people of DC. Um, community-based learning will be one of these <coughs> tools that we use to enhance their education and so forth. Um, we even have some strategic goals for year five and six that say, you know, every student before they graduate will have the opportunity to take a community-based learning class here at the institution. Um, and so at AU, we have two, two primary different ways that um, students can get involved in community-based learning. Um, one is through a designated community-based learning course. Um, this is new, was new last spring. Um, where students, when they went to register through the registrar, they'd actually see a CV designation um, next to the class. If you register for honors, it's an H. If it's a university college class, it's a UC. 
um, and we're working on a marketing campaign, well Becca's working on a marketing campaign, to share with students what does that mean. So they need to know, because this is good for some students and not great for others that might be super busy, they might not want to engage in the community, they might not have time, um, whereas other students are really looking for this type of opportunity. So we want to make sure they know what they're getting involved with. Um, in each semester, there's about 16 to 20 classes um, that have this designation. I know that the course that is taught during the spring semester, which is a tax preparation mm -hmm. course, has a designation, but I don't think the fall course has the designation. Can I work with you to get the designation? Yeah, I think okay. that that would be really great. Okay. Um, and I um, the acting dean would like it to be that. Fantastic. So. Um, so we can, I will send you the information afterwards okay. on how to go about doing that. Um, and classes that, and I don't believe there are any language courses that have the CD designation, but I think it would be something very exciting to expand. Um, mm -hmm. And so <laughs> there's a call for registrations, there's a series of eight criteria for community-based learning that the class needs to meet. Um, and then there's a faculty review committee that reviews the syllabi and says, great, or please tweak these three things, and then your course will be designated. Um, and so I can make sure that you, you guys have that information. So that's over here. Um, and then the other thing is students at AU are awesome, and they like to do their own thing. They like to, you know, if what they see doesn't exist, they create a club, they find their own internship. Well, if the class that they want to take does not have this CD designation, they can make their own, which is what the Community Service Learning Program actually is. Um, and so it enables any student across the university to, um, for completing 40 hours of um, service, participating in three reflection sessions with the Center for Community Engagement um, and doing some type of culminating project that is a critically reflective project that makes connections between that service um, and what is happening in the classroom, they're able to earn a pass-fail credit that's connected to that course. Um, and it's specifically a credit that um, the individual faculty member will give for the student for doing the work that connects to that class. Um, so that's like very basically what it, um, what the program is, and then it's the faculty members and the students and the partners that really help to make it unique for each student, um, almost like an independent study. And so I'm going to pass it on to Amanda now, if you can share with us some of your experiences with the program. Okay. Uh, so students have been doing the CSLP credit in my class for four years now, mm -hmm. and basically the way that we do this project is. Typically, one, the students already in the community-based class that I teach. This spring, I had a social justice-themed college writing course, um, but they weren't required to do community-based learning for the course. They could opt to do the CSLP credit, and four young men actually chose to do the CSLP credit. Mm -hmm. uh, so they and then seven other students from my actual community-based class did the project this year. I emphasize from the beginning, one, that academic credit is very much for academic work. Just because you do 40 hours of service at your placement does not mean that you get the credit. That project at the end has to be a major part of it. And one way that I think professors need to look at CSLP is look at the learning objectives for your department or your teaching unit and think about, okay, how could I create a project or how can I help students create a project that will help meet these objectives. So for instance, in college writing, we want them to be familiar with different ways of researching and research literacy. We want them to become competent, thinking about audience and writing assignments, purpose, how they might change their writing style or form depending on the purpose of a project. So one student who was actually an English second language student was more insecure about his writing ability, worked with another student and they made basically a manual of how to go to the farmer's market and then create sort of this food kitchen for senior citizens at a local senior citizen center to go to the food kitchen. So he had to, one, think about, well, what kind of writing, what kind of language am I going to use, what kind of rhetoric would make sense in this setting, because audience-wise, it may not make sense to make the same language choices that he would if he was working in our class or writing an academic paper as if he was working with senior citizens and writing for a more general audience, right? Uh, two, he had to think about, okay, 
what are the kinds of foods that these senior citizens want at their like food kitchen at the senior center. They want to be able to make their own meals in their apartments. They want to make things that are easy, but not say mac and cheese. So they did a little bit of thinking, they did some research, they talked to the people in the community, they looked at what the senior center already had going on, and then they looked at some research, okay, so what do people recommend for people in this kind of setting who have maybe a smaller kitchen and want to do some of the work themselves, but may not have all the capabilities or access that other people might have in a full kitchen. So that's one way to think about it. Um, I brought another student project for example, um, another way that I like using CSLP because the students have to do the 40 hours of work. If a student is work study eligible, they can work with DC Reads or Jumpstart. I think those are the two organizations that AU partners with right now. And not only will they get the academic credit for doing the 40 hours to the organization, they will also get work study hours. So I like giving this to students that need to do work study but also want to do community service because it makes it possible to do both things for them. Uh, one young woman did a workshop with DC Reads. They didn't have, she felt, enough tutor training on the language that tutors use when working with students. So she and her partner worked with their education professor, so they're already tying together their other coursework to create a workshop for DC Reads tutors on campus about how do you choose the language you use with students. Should you say, oh, you are smart or, oh, that was a really good idea. Let's look at doing this more deeply. Does that make sense? So I have that example here, if you'd like to see. And so I think it's just important to reinforce that the faculty member plays a very integral role uh, because of the way the program is set up. Um, we have very little touch points with the faculty members. I have a lot of touch points with the community organizations and with the students. Um, and so sometimes at the end of the semester, students will say, you know, my faculty member was awesome. She checked in on me like at the end, you know, once every couple of weeks at the end of class, we get to talk about the experience. We sat down for coffee and, and reflected or whatever the case might be. They don't like to use the term reflect, but we chatted. Um, but then I have others that are like, I don't even know if my faculty member really knew that I was doing this program until the end of semester when they had to give me the grade. And so I like to reinforce that the larger the role the faculty member can play, um, even with the the very large competing things that you all have to do, um, usually the better experience it is for the student. Um, I've seen from time to time a student, I had a student that was working at a very liberal organization and was a very conservative student and she didn't realize that when she got involved to begin with. So she, it was very difficult for her. Um, but the faculty member was phenomenal and was really helpful um, in her development, in her critical understanding of, you know, even though I'm totally ideologically opposed to what this organization is doing, I still gained X, Y, and Z from working on it. And she's actually one of my student leaders with the program today because she was able to have to process through that experience. Um, just a snapshot of CSLP, um, it started in 1994 and the numbers that I have, there have been almost a thousand students who've participated, um, they've contributed over 40,000 hours of service in the DC community predominantly, um, and each semester we find that our numbers are growing and so in the spring we had 68 students. Um, they were collaborating with 44 different faculty members. They were working at 39 different community organizations. Um, they contributed almost 3,000 hours of service. So in the early days, I usually saw numbers that, I was not here, but that were like five to 12 students. Um, and now the numbers per semester are at minimum around 40 um, and ranging up to like 75 might be the largest semester that I've seen. Um, and thus Becca's addition into our lives to help us with some of this. Um, so we talked a lot about the students, but let's pass it over to Shantae so you can talk to us a little bit more about your experience. Hi, um, I started CSLP as a freshman and I didn't really know what I was getting into. Um, I just remember Meg coming to my Spanish course and telling us about um, this awesome program and I had done community service in high school so I wanted to continue. And so I actually was tutoring with DC Reads at the time. And like Amanda said, I was able, it worked out because I was able to connect it to work study as well as um, CSLP. And um, I initially went in and wasn't really sure exactly what I was doing, um, but it was great because I felt like my professor that semester was really supportive. And she made sure that what my actual, I guess, experience was with, with um, 
at that time, I believe it was, I know it's up there. Head Start. Head Start, yeah, um, definitely connected. And so it was a really big time for me to grow because I actually had to write lesson plans. And I went into DC Read thinking I was just going to go tutor. And it turned mm -hmm. out like the program I was in, they needed a lot more from us and they required a lot more from us. So I found myself making lesson plans for first graders and kindergartners and actually facilitating them pretty well. And I was like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> I didn't think I could do this. Um, and I just knew that I wanted to keep doing it. And so unfortunately I maxed out by my sophomore year because I just did it consecutively throughout the three semesters. Um, but I, I think I would say the best experience I had was um, at LAYC, which is actually at Alice Dill Middle School right in Tenley Town. And I worked with uh, a lot of Latin American students and one of them actually was from Argentina and had only been here for about, I'd say six months. And so her English was like not, you know, it, it needed a lot of de development. And I was able to speak to her in Spanish and in English. And you saw her like over the, the time period that I was there get um, improved immensely with her English skills. And I also got to practice my Spanish, so it was great. Um, and yeah, we really bond, her name's Carmen. And um, so yeah, I think that a, a lot of times like you don't realize how much the service can actually connect to the course. Um, but when I think brainstorming, and like I actually did get to brainstorm with my professors, and at least I was lucky because all my professors have been really helpful, um, you get to actually see how the service can connect to your class. And, um, and then like with the final projects, most of the time I wrote journals and they were in Spanish, so it allowed me to practice my writing skills as well. So yeah. <laughs> Shantae. Um, Shantae is a phenomenal student, um, we're very happy to have her here, but her story is not particularly unique. I hear from many of my students, you know, I've done this, there's a three, you can only take the CSLP credit three times in according to the academic regs, and so um, that's great for a student, it's like getting a full class almost by the time they graduate. Um, it is included in the tuition up to that 17 credit hour mark. So if a student, you know, is at 14 credits and they want to do a little more, it's something that's great for them. Um, students that haven't reached enough um, credit hours to do internships, this is another really nice opportunity for them. They get to at a lower, um, for a lower risk basically, because 40 hours, we're talking like three to four hours a week, they can get a similar experience to an internship and actually earn academic credit, um, but at a lower risk than if, you know, and they'd actually be able to do it um, at that point in time, so that's great. And I hear at the end of the semester, we have a final reflection session, um, and many students share what Shantae shared. So I made this personal connection. Um, it helped me to connect in the professional realm, so it's a career development opportunity. Um, I learned that I never want to go into education, and it's really great that I was working with those five-year-olds just once a week for this amount of time to realize this, as opposed to continue down my education path for kindergarten. Um, and so I've seen a lot of really positive outcomes from this program with students. Um, and now I want to pass it to Lucy and Alex so we can hear what happens outside of the walls of AU. Um, what really happens when the student gets to you? Sure, so just briefly about our organization. We uh, provide educational services for primarily underserved uh, Latino uh, families and students. And we have four programs that we work with students from K, pre-K to 12. Uh, and we have an access which helps families look an access program which helps families look at educational options for private and parochial school. Uh, we have a tutoring program which a lot of AU students, independently of CSLP and with CSLP, come to tutor with us since we're right down the road. Uh, we have a Listo College Prep program where we work with nine to twelve grade students to help them get prepared and for college and career. And then we have uh, our final which our final program which is our scholars program, which we uh, give small stipends to be able to attend these private and parochial schools in the D.C. metro area, and that's Maryland and Virginia as well. Um, for us, uh, it was pretty easy to see and be, to think about the connection that we could make uh, and that has had, that this program has benefited our organization just in the tutoring aspect on Saturdays uh, for our mentoring that we're, we're going to be looking to try to do for this year. Um, for office support. Uh, a lot of our CSLP students in the fall were there to help us out with input and be able to see how a nonprofit can work. We're a very small nonprofit, there's only four of us who are full time on staff. Um, and we have a lot of events that go on for our students and for our organization ourselves. And I'm going to let Lucy be able to talk about how that connection and how we really 
leaned on students from AU and how important uh, they are for, for our success of our programs. Yeah, so um, this past fall, um, Alex and I, before we tra currently we're working on the college prep program now, um, but last fall we were actually working on our tutoring program, which last year we served about 80 students every Saturday and then averaged about 80 tutors as well. So, and this is just Alex and I running this program, mm -hmm. um, which you can imagine was just hectic. We had children coming in from uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia, and of course they weren't all there at 10 a.m. So, <laughs> I mean, we were just scrambling most of the time. And um, we, I don't even, I, I don't know how the students found us, but we actually had six students from AU um, come to us. And they first came to us as just volunteers. They wanted to check out the Saturday morning tutoring program because they wanted to be tutors for younger students. Um, but they were just phenomenal. And um, I believe we had at least three of them look into receiving um, internship credit. I believe it's through the Spanish department or the Latin American um, studies department. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and they were freshmen. And so we had five freshmen and one sophomore. And they, uh, over the semester, we just, we really, like Alex said, we leaned on them for support. So rather than having them as tutors, we thought, wow, these are really great students. They're dedicated. They're always here, um, you know, continuously every Saturday. Not only that, they would usually arrive early. They would ask, hey, how can we get more involved? And so Alex and I sat down and we said, hey, look, we're running around like crazy mm -hmm. on Saturday. Let's um, see how we can integrate them into the program. So we eventually gave um, these six students the role as coordinators um, at our Saturday morning tutoring program. So we had one student run pre-K, um, which was kids ages three to five. So that meant checking in the students, checking in the tutors, and then just kind of overseeing the students um, for that two hour period. And then we had um, the other five, we broke down the grades kind of, uh, it was like first grade through third grade, third through fifth, um, fourth through seventh, and so on. Um, and so those were the coordinators. So if you were in that grade, you went to those uh, to that coordinator specifically. So um, it was really great because it was able to, I guess, alleviate Alex and I to talk to the parents. Um, and I think by mid-October, the kids and the parents knew that was their person. And that was really great about the AU students. And you know, not to uh, talk about the other universities in DC. You can. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we real. I mean, we also had volunteers from there, but none were as consistent as AU. And I think it's just that culture that is here on campus and at the university. Um, and then our final student was <coughs> actually we run at the same time that we're running tutoring for our kids. We run ESL program or ESL and citizenship programming for our parents. And so we also had one student that just oversaw that program that was actually run upstairs completely. So um, we really depended on the students and you could tell because once Christmas break came and they all went home, we were just like, oh gosh, <laughs> what are we gonna do? <laughs> because we had you know, gotten so accustomed to them over the, the year. And so um, what was really great is if they knew that this coming Saturday was gonna be like a Thanksgiving themed um, tutoring session, they would come in Fridays and either do lesson planning like um, Shantae did um, or you know come up with various activities and we gave them that flexibility. I mean we said we were completely open if they had any questions of us. So not only did they see the programming side but they were also able to come into the office and really see the logistical like mm -hmm. inner workings of um, our small nonprofit. And so we were like Alex said we're a small staff so we were really open to having them there. I mean and we really like took them in as they came. So Meg said, really and the, the piggyback on that is Meg said about strengthening communities, those students were essential to be able to have them for that set amount of time that we knew that we could rely on them, that they had that they had to be there, but they wanted to be there. And it really helped with our families knowing that we had consistent people who they could who they could work with. And the same thing for us is that a lot of times with our volunteers it's Saturday morning, it's hard traveling. But we knew that we would have those students and if they were benefiting uh, by working with us, be able to see that you know, they had to use Spanish sometimes, especially for the Spanish language, that they had to be able to see uh, time management and how to be able to run a program. So they're getting the idea of community uh, development and community service uh, and really seeing the importance of youth development as well. Uh, and so we really were cognizant of the fact that we want the students to have that experience that is not just limited to their class, but that could lead them to some other areas. So we have a student, Julia, 
uh, who I wrote a recommendation letter for because she wanted to go for youth development and is trying to go for various positions at the Smithsonian. And she really wanted to work um, in youth development and work especially with Latin American youth and this gave her the opportunity to do that as, long as, as well as speak Spanish. Uh, and so this was just all encompassing. It was, it was a great program and we're looking forward for, for next year. And, uh, yeah, I mean, starting up actually <laughs> this semester yeah, next yeah, year. Very yeah. soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm going to go into the logistics about the program, but I wanted to send it out to you guys first if you have any specific questions while we're thinking about partnerships or the faculty side or the student side. Um, that would be helpful to get, you know, more grounding. Is there a place where I can look at things like what are the requirements and what are the benefits to the CD designation for the class? Yeah, so, um, for, I'll take us to the website afterwards so we can see all of those pieces that talk about the benefits. This particular screen, which is huge and overwhelming and I couldn't figure out how to make it look any better, um, but talks about the specific logistics for the community service learning program. Um, but it takes us through um, and this is for the add-on credit option. I can get you information about for the designation as a whole, but mm -hmm. one of the things when I think of the designation, it's like imagine every single one of your students in your class doing CSLP. Um, so instead of having individual sessions with your students to talk about their individual experiences, um, you can then say, okay, here's your four community partners that you can choose from as opposed to anything you want. Um, and you can take more of your class time um, to do these experiences. Can you speak to that more? Uh, so I've actually done both models where you give the students a list and say, find what works with you and your interests. And there are certain benefits to that. But at the same time, it's harder to keep track and tabs on students working with, say, 10 or 12 organizations across 18 students than it is to keep track of students who are working with four, three or four organizations that you probably have an already established relationship with. Um, I pretty much now work with DC Reads and or Jumpstart because they have pretty similar goals and missions. Uh, Horton's Kids, which is an after school program I used to work for. Uh, and then either DC Central Kitchen or another organization that the students say, hey, four or five of us have a really strong desire to work with this kind of organization. And hopefully it's someone that Meg and I already have some kind of connection to or can work with. If you go with, say, three to four community partners over one class, it's easier to contact three people and figure out what the students are doing. It also gives them partners to work with on that final project. So it's not just one person trying to pull this together. It's each person adding something to this different project. So if I can say what has worked well, it would definitely be pick a few partners that you know well or CCEF knows well and stick with those instead of find what you would like from this ma massive list. So we have massive lists as well, if that's what you're all looking for. Um, going back to the community service learning program, that's a little bit more difficult to manage where your students are volunteering and what it is that you're doing. Um, it's more of a self-started program by the student and so they, we advertise the CSLP registration deadline is the same as the deadline for ad drop. So this year it's September 8th um, and before the registration deadline we do a few things. One, we have a community partner corner as part of the much larger involvement fair that happens on the quad on September 3rd. So Alex will be there um, and Lucy as well as maybe 30 different nonprofits that we work closely with. Um, this way students can go, they can meet with somebody ahead of time, um, they're getting that face-to-face -face interaction because the deadline is so quick and they need a community partner to register for this credit. Um, we find that sometimes it's difficult for the students when they're emailing the organizations to see if they can volunteer um, or calling them to get a response as quickly as they need one and so we've started adding this corner to the fair so that students can make that connection um, right there and get set up. We also do classroom presentations for faculty members interested in offering this as an option to their students and we probably do maybe 50 or 60 of them within those first two weeks um, of the semester. And as you heard with Shantae, that's how a lot of students learn that this even exists and is an option. And while we don't have any um, classes in world languages and cultures that have the CB designation, your faculty, better than any other faculty I know, bring us in to do these community service 
learning program presentations. They're all about it um, because especially the Spanish, Spanish faculty are like, you know what? Mm -hmm. You're going to be better at this if you practice in Spanish more than just these three days a week that you happen to be in front of me. Um, and hopefully that, that they're seeing those results at the end and I imagine they are as they have us keep coming back. Um, we also on our website have 16 different nonprofit directories. Um, these are broken up by issue area and this is what Amanda was speaking to. Um, you know, the student goes to the fair, they don't like what they see, um, they want to go at their own and they want to find an organization to work with. On our website they can choose from, I mean there are thousands of organizations um, throughout the DC area and we try to note the ones that we have a working relationship with. Um, this can be good or it can be bad. Sometimes a student finds a gem and it's really great and we start a partnership with that organization. Um, but students also need to know that, you know, I have, like, I can call Alex and say, hey, Sasha has been by three times, it didn't work. This would never happen with a Latino student fund, but like, what's the story down there? And Alex will get back to me the same day. I don't have that type of relationship with these other organizations. Um, and so we try to make sure the students know that. Um, the, so that's what happens on the beginning grounds. Then the students go into our online registration system and they actually register themselves. They like apply for the credit. Um, I review it. I make sure the student must have a 2.5 GPA. It has to be connected to an SAS, a CAS, a COGOD, or an SPA course. Um, it, right now you can't do it with the School of Communications. Um, they need to, it can't be connected to a graduate course. I look through those things and then it gets forwarded to a faculty member for review. So now Amanda can look at it and say, this has nothing to do with college writing. No, yeah. you can't work with that partner. No, you can't do a PowerPoint. You're going to do more of a project. So there will be a longer paper connected to that project explaining the research methods you went through, why you're doing this, mm -hmm. your personal connection to it. Um, but basically at that point I'm looking at what they're proposing the final project is and even if say we've talked about in class it's not always what they put on there for some reason they want to keep clicking PowerPoint mm -hmm. um, so yeah um, and so we have a list of possible final projects that the students can do to demonstrate the learning um, that they're they're doing between the classroom and the what's happening in the community um, but this is just like your faculty and students get the brainstorm rolling, it's really up to you as faculty members to determine what that student's actually going to do with the program and the level of the work that comes out of it. We find typically the, the lower the class, like Shantae, I imagine in theory what you did for like your first 252 level class should have been a little bit easier than what you did for your 350 whatever. Yeah, I think I had like more journal entries at yeah. the time I did it my first. Uh, because you're earning a higher level credit. Um, and so the faculty member reviews what happens through our online system. Um, it, it gets approved right through the system and then the student goes to an orientation on the community service learning program. Um, and this is what my office is responsible for. So we make sure that the student knows, you know, here are some emergency protoc protocol when you're going and you're working with community partners. Um, here are some culturally sensitive ways in which to engage into a community that you might not be familiar with. Um, I love, Lucy, that you were like, hey, students were great. They showed up. They let me know if they were going to be there. We train them on that, so I really <laughs> hope that that's the way that they're showing up because we want for our students um, to really be good representations of AU when they're out in the community. Um, and we also let them know about their final, pro like, you have to do a final project. Here's what you need to do to earn this credit. Um, students sometimes forget halfway through the semester that the this is an academic credit that they're earning, and so they might say, yeah, I'm just not doing CSLP any longer as if it was a club that they signed up for um, and sometimes it's like a little moment that they have when we sit down and I'm like that's fine Emily but you it's past the add drop period and so you're either failing this credit or you're finishing the obligations for the credit um, and so that's something that we really try to hit home during orientation so that they realize like you don't just stop going to your Spanish class halfway through the semester because it got hard like you, you do it because you're you registered for it um, and especially if you talk at the beginning of the semester about the requirements for the 40 hours and what your expectations are for that project. If it is a student who has a job and wants to do the 40 hour credit and is taking the maximum course load and is doing something else, those are students that I'm typically like, this may not be the semester to do this. Mm -hmm. Like as much as AU students want to do everything, 
increasingly it's normally second semester freshmen that think they can do everything and sometimes you have to be the bad guy and tell them this is too much mm -hmm. like this is not going to work out well mm -hmm. do you have to have 40 hours on site or can it be 40 hours in support of because i have a research project going on that is more in support of is totally okay. acceptable um and it just depends on what the community partner um, in terms of the CV designation that we're talking about, those have the requirement to be designated as a CV course is 20 hours of service or a comparable project. Um, so I know that typically the Washington Initiative program mm -hmm. that I've seen in the fall has been, you know, we're working with Mommy's TLC and we're creating a marketing campaign for your gallery. Right. They might only be at Mommy's for like 10 minutes to talk to somebody, but that project definitely took them 20 hours to sure. work on. And right. so that would qualify in that so level. So it's, it's a comparable project mm -hmm. this semester. Mm -hmm. um, CB class is a good option. And, and, and a project. Yeah. So that's great. Um, I would definitely want to talk to you and see if I can do that, especially for um, it's a one credit course or a two credit course, so mm -hmm. the people that have the two credits, what can we do to increase their... Absolutely, what they're getting. Mm -hmm. I'm doing that. That's fantastic. Um, so after they go to orientation, we take care of all of the registration for you. So we work with the registry, with the registrar, we make sure this is showing up on students' transcripts um, and that when you go back to give them that final pass-fail grade, um, you can the credit actually exists for you. Um, we follow up with a mid-year reflection session with the students. We follow up with an end-of-year evaluation or reflection session with the students. We make sure that we get um, some feedback and evaluations from both our community partners and our faculty, like how to go, what can we do better, um, how can we work on this project. And we actually ask if your students are doing any type of presentation in your class related to the project, if we can come and see it. Um, because that's how I, it's such an independent project for students that it's nice for me, be to, me to be able to be there so I have the knowledge to talk about what the students are actually doing in the community um, beyond what they submit on their academic forms. Um, and students keep track of their hours on an hour log. Um, it's very basic. It's a piece of paper. It gets signed off by the community partner. I'm sure Alex and Lucy have seen however many of them. Um, it's the best way that we have found to ensure that there is like an actual signature next to the hours and the students aren't making up their hours. Um, they submit it to our office. We scan it and send it to faculty members so that you can then, when you're giving the final grade, say, okay, did you do your 40 hours? Yes, Meg says so. And did you do the final project? I witnessed it with you. Um, so those are the whole logistics and like how this particular program actually works. Any other thoughts or questions? Do you think it might be good going forward with your students as an option? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I really think that the CSLP is really helpful because it allows students the ability to both like make it have, like choose this as a credit for them, and mm -hmm. I, I like that they're able to kind of have different faculty who are able to say, okay, you know, let's structure this for you so it's not quite mm -hmm. loosey goosey. So I think it's like a really good happy medium of mm -hmm. having students. You know, continue their learning, but, but they're able to seek it out. So mm -hmm. I, I really think that our students, I would love to see them do this in like year two. Mm -hmm. So our students do um, 20 hours of service, um, and they, their community partners right now are tied with their courses mm -hmm. and their faculty courses. So I think this is like a good part two, so that then they can either work with a faculty who has a good relationship or choose to continue to stay at the, the partners they know. So very cool program. Um, one of the other things we wanted to highlight is that we're actually part of a much broader network, service learning network throughout the Maryland DC region called the Maryland DC Campus Compact. Um, and Maryland DC Campus Compact has a service learning and civic engagement conference that is, I would say it's like 80% student focused, but there's definitely tracks of the conference for faculty and staff members that do this line of work. Um, and in 2015, the conference will actually be like in this room. So <laughs> we'll be bringing um, probably up to 300, three to 400 people will be coming here on March 28th. 
um, from the Maryland DC region interested in service learning um, and we'll be exploring some best practices in service learning. Sessions will be offered by faculty members, staff, students, community partners um, to really celebrate this work that happens in the region, look at trends, um, and see how we can collaborate um, on these types of things. Amanda and her students have been awesome and have gone for the past two years. I think this is actually a quote by one of them. I'm happy I went. It was mind blowing. Any uh, uh, context for this quote? Uh, she, this student was the partner for the DC Reads project um, with another student. She did not do the CSLP credit. She wished after she went to the conference she did do the CSLP credit. She thought it was too much and she realized later one. She was starting to connect the work that she was doing in my class with that education class, and they came up with this training for the DC Reads tutors. She was doing enough work anyway because she genuinely liked what she was studying. She liked the project they were creating. She wished she had gotten the credit for the 40 hours of work. So I think, especially if your students choose your class, they have some kind of direction and help in shaping the project, like Gretchen said, but they're also picking something that they're genuinely interested in academically they're going to become more invested, they're going to get more out of the class, they're going to want to do more things involved with the class, like this conference. Mm -hmm. And I think beyond this, in terms of professional development opportunities for faculty, there are much like higher level conferences that we're connected to. Um, there's an IAR SLICE, which is International Association for Research on Service Learning and Civic Engagement, I think. Um, which we've had faculty members um, who have published on this type of work. Um, even if it's a case, you know, the students in this class, this is what they produce, this has been the outcome for the faculty members, have presented this work at, you know, an international research conference on service learning. Um, I know we had faculty members present two years ago and it was in Baltimore, and this upcoming year, I think it's in New Orleans. Um, but I just want to say like it's broader it's not this like one credit thing there's some it's much larger um, for faculty members um, and for students that want to be involved I think that's all that I have except for this fun picture of one of our students that has been involved in the program um, for a long time um, seeking questions um, but I'm happy to hang out if you have any more questions about the program um, I would love to show you our website that we just put a lot of time into um, on community-based learning and um, civic engagement um, that really serves as an outline of the different things that we do from the course designation to the service learning program um, and it's right here through this website. If you do American.edu slash volunteer, that will bring you to it, um, where you can learn everything you need to know about the course designation, the eight criteria, how you can go about registering your class, um, along with, we've just added eight new pages. Um, so for each of the criteria, if you're like, how do I get the entire class involved? What does reciprocity mean? Um, we have additional web pages that bring you to more resources and you know, what does this mean? How do I actually um, implement this with my class? What's the timeline that I can use? Um, so that's for getting the full class involved. And then if you're interested in the add-on credit, um, you can also see that there are resources that take you to more information about that and how you can offer that for your students. We also have, I'm excited about this one too, um, an events page. So this highlights all of our annual events um, and there's registration forms. So for instance, we're having a partnership brunch um, on August 27th at 9.30, um, which I think is in this exact room. Um, we usually have about 20 community partners and 20 faculty members and you can learn from each other as to how you can collaborate. Um, and as I got excited about using Common Spot, you can now click register to attend and it takes you right to the registration form, um, which will enable you just to sign up and show up and meet some great partners and also have a lovely breakfast of Furtado. August 27th. Um,
In the back of the room I have a CSLP poster, so if you have advising students and want to leave it in your office, that would be awesome. Um, we have a talking guide for how does a student, because this is very independent, reach out to Alex or Lucy and say, I want to volunteer with you in a way that lets them know they're serious and will hang out and stick around. Um, and I, we also have the sample of the projects that students could potentially work on. I think that has everything. I'm sorry we ended so quickly, so <laughs> your day has just cut so much shorter. Um, but thank you guys very much for being here. And panel, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come